Hello everybody again, it's good to see you here for session number five of the Secrets of Pentecost. Time does fly, doesn't it? And the topic that we're going to study tonight is titled Chain of Command. But we want to pray first. Never do we open the Bible without prayer because the Holy Spirit inspired Scripture and only the Holy Spirit can explain it to us. So I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Our loving Father, we come before you this evening as we've done in the previous sessions, realizing our own ignorance, our own lack of knowledge and wisdom. That's why we're coming before your throne to request that you will be present with us through the ministry of your spirit and your angels. We desperately need wisdom from on high, for we're going to study a very important subject. And therefore, we ask that you will make yourself present in this place that our minds might be opened, our hearts might be opened, that we might be able to understand and receive that which you have for us today. We thank you for the privilege of approaching your throne and for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. One of the hotly debated doctrines in the church today not only the church in general, but the Seventh-day Adventist church, is the topic of the Holy Spirit. There are many individuals who believe that the Holy Spirit is simply a force, an impersonal force, that the Holy Spirit is not a person. I believe that one of the reasons why people believe that the Holy Spirit is a force or perhaps a substance that is infused or poured into us is because of the metaphors that the Bible uses to describe the Holy Spirit. For example, the Holy Spirit is described in the Bible as a dove. The Spirit is described as rain, as oil, as wind, as fire. And therefore, because of these metaphors, uh, people get the impression that the Holy Spirit is these things. But these are metaphors of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a dove. The Holy Spirit is not rain. The Holy Spirit is not oil. The Holy Spirit is not fire, and the Holy Spirit is not wind. All of these are metaphors that describe functions of the Holy Spirit. For example, wind, we can see its effects, but we can't see the wind. The same way with the Holy Spirit, we can see the results of His work, but we can't actually see the Holy Spirit. You know, oil gives a light to a lamp. And so the Holy Spirit enlightens our minds. Rain makes uh, the seed germinate and grow, just like the Holy Spirit makes our spiritual life grow. And so all of these metaphors of the Holy Spirit are simply descriptive of the functions that the Holy Spirit fulfills. The Holy Spirit is not these things. And yet for many people it's very difficult to conceive of the Holy Spirit as someone who speaks, as someone who loves, who reasons, who helps, who guides, who reproves, etc. Now, the spirit of prophecy is very clear that the Holy Spirit is a person. And uh, Ellen White is also very clear that the Godhead is composed of three distinct persons. And so as we begin our study, I want to read a few statements from the writings of Ellen White on the Godhead and the personality of the Holy Spirit. The first of these statements we find in the book Evangelism, page 616. Uh, this is in a speech that Ellen White gave to the students at Avondale. It was actually a morning worship. And Ellen White had this to say, We need to realize that the Holy Spirit, who is as much a person as God is a person, is walking through these grounds. The Holy Spirit is as much a person as God is a person. In the book Evangelism, pages 616 and 617, Ellen White has this to say, The Holy Spirit is a person, for He beareth witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. When this witness is born, it carries with it its own evidence. At such times we believe and are sure that we are the children of God. The Holy Spirit has a personality, she says, or else He could not bear witness to our spirits and with our spirits that we are the children of God. 
he must also be a divine person, or else he could not search out the secrets which lie hidden in the mind of God. For what, ma what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now I want to read several statements where she also makes it clear that the Godhead is composed of three distinct persons. This is from Evangelism, page 617. The prince of the power of evil can only be held in check by the power of God in the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. So if the Holy Spirit is a third person, there must be a second and there must be a first. In uh, Evangelism page 617, she says this, We are to cooperate with the three highest powers in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these powers will work through us, making us workers together with God. So she describes three highest powers in heaven. Uh, in another quotation that we find in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, volume 7, page 908, she has this to say, Our sanctification is the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is the fulfillment of the covenant God has made with those who bind themselves up with Him, to stand with Him, His Son, and His Spirit in holy fellowship. Have you been born again? Have you become a new being in Christ Jesus? Then cooperate with the three great powers of heaven who are working in your behalf. Time and again she emphasizes that there are three great powers in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all three of them are real persons. They are not impersonal forces or energy forces, they are persons. Now, the Holy Spirit also has an element of mystery to Him. I'm not saying that we can explain everything concerning the Holy Spirit. I want to read this statement that we find in the book Acts of the Apostles, pages 51 and 52. It is not essential for us to be able to define just what the Holy Spirit is. Christ tells us that the Spirit is the Comforter, the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father. It is plainly declared regarding the Holy Spirit that in His work of guiding men into all truth He shall not speak of Himself. And then she says this, the nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. So notice the Bible explains His work, but the Bible does not explain His nature. So there's one aspect which is a mystery, which is the nature of the Holy Spirit, but His work can be known because we can see His work in the Scriptures. So finishing the statement, the nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. Men cannot explain it because the Lord has not revealed it to them. Men having fanciful views may bring together passages of Scripture and put a human construction on them, but the acceptance of these views will not strengthen the church Regarding such mysteries which are too deep for human understanding, silence is golden. So we are not going to delve into the nature of the Holy Spirit. We're going to study how the Holy Spirit works, how it is revealed in the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy. Now we want to begin by going to Psalm 8 and verses 3 through 8. And there's two points that I want us to notice in this passage. First of all, when God created Adam, He created him as king. That was his office or his position. Secondly, God gave him a territory over which to rule, which was everything concerning planet earth. So two ideas in this passage. The position of Adam was that of king, and the realm of his dominion was planet earth. So let's go to Psalm 8 and verses 3 through 8. Here the psalmist says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him, this is speaking about the creation of man, for you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. Let me ask you, who wears crowns? Kings wear crowns. In fact, Ellen White says that Adam was crowned king in Eden. 
So it says here, you have crowned him with glory and honor. Now if he's a king, he's going to have a territory over which he rules. Now notice, what is the territory? You have made him to have dominion, that means rulership. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. That's an expression that means you have placed him to rule over everything. Over everything. And then we see what that is. All sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. Now when the Bible mentions heaven, earth, and seas, it means everything. Everything concerning planet earth. So in other words, Adam was placed upon this earth as king to rule over the entire planet, over this territory. And it was the plan of God that as eternity should pass, that Adam would continue to be king of this planet, and that he rule over the things of this earth. But sin interrupted God's plan. Romans chapter 6 and verse 16 gives us a very important principle, and that is that we are slaves of the one whom we choose to obey. I want to read that verse because it expresses a very important principle. You see, God wanted Adam to obey him. But when Adam chose to obey Satan, he became a servant of Satan. And Satan took over the throne, and he took over the territory that belonged to Adam, because Adam now became subject, and Satan became Lord. Notice Romans 6 and verse 16. The Apostle Paul says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness, we are slaves of the one that we choose to obey. And Adam chose to obey Satan, and so Satan now took over the throne of the world, and he took over the territory over which Adam had originally ruled. Adam lost both. He lost his position as king, and he lost the territory over which he governed. But God promised that it would be recovered. Notice Patriarchs and Prophets, page 67. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 67. It says here, at his creation, Adam was placed in dominion over the earth. So, do you see the position as king? He was placed in dominion over the earth. But by yielding to temptation, he was brought under the power of Satan. And then Ellen White quotes 2 Peter 2.19, which expresses the same principle as Romans 6.16, which we read. Uh, the verse says, of whom a man is overcome, of the same he is brought in bondage. In other words, whoever overcomes you, you're in bondage to the one that overcame you. Then she continues saying, when man became Satan's captive, the dominion which he held passed to his conqueror. Is that clear? Then it continues saying, thus Satan became the god of this world. He had usurped that dominion over the earth which had been originally given to Adam. But Christ, by His sacrifice, paying the penalty of sin, would not only redeem man, but re would recover the dominion which He had forfeited. All that was lost by the first Adam will be restored by the second. Amen. So in other words, Jesus came to this er earth to take away from Satan what Satan had taken away from Adam. Satan took over the throne, and he took over the territory. Jesus said, I'm going to go and I'm going to live and die for man, and in living and dying for man, I am going to take back the throne, and I'm going to take back the territory in place of man. Now Satan claimed dominion to this world. Notice Luke chapter 4 and verses 5 through 7. Luke chapter 4, 5 through 7, this is on the Mount of Temptation. And I want you to notice the devil laid claim to being the king or the ruler of this realm, of this world. Uh, it says there, Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you, and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Who had given it to the devil? Adam. The devil says, hey, this rulership has been given to me, and I give it to whoever I wish. So if you just bow down and worship me, I'll give you the throne, and I'll give you the territory 
and you can rule over it, and you don't even have to go to the cross, you don't even have to die. But then there's a condition, the devil says, therefore if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And so what was the mission of Jesus Christ? The mission of Christ was to recover the throne and the territory that Adam lost. But in order to do this, Jesus had to accomplish two things in His earthly ministry. First of all, He had to live a perfect life, which the law requires and which Adam and his descendants cannot offer the law. And secondly, Jesus had to bear the sins of humanity upon Himself and He had to pay the penalty for sin in place of man. So Jesus had to live for man and Jesus had to die for man. He had to live a perfect life to offer the law of God and He had to carry the sins of humanity and pay the debt of sin that human beings had incurred. And that's exactly what Jesus did. The last week of His life, according to John 12 verses 31 to 33, Jesus made a very interesting prediction. I want you to notice what Jesus said to those who were gathered there. Once again, John 12, verse 31 through 33. Jesus says, and He's speaking about His death, Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be what? Cast out. Now He's not going to be the ruler anymore, is what Jesus is saying. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And then He, he explains what event was going to cast Him out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. So what was it that was going to cast out the ruler of this world? It was the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And of course we could say also his life, because if Jesus was not a perfect lamb, his death would not have been of any, any value. So we have to connect his perfect life with his death because he has to offer his perfect life to the law, and then he has to offer death to the law in our place as well. So when Jesus on the cross said, it is finished, he had won back the throne, and he had won back the territory, and the enemy had been cast out. Ellen White describes this in a beautiful way. Desire of Ages, page 758. She says, Christ did not yield up his life till he had accomplished the work which he came to do. And with his parting breath he exclaimed, It is finished. Now notice, notice the terminology here. The battle had been won. Where was, was Jesus still going to win the battle after the cross? No, 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 no. It says the battle had been won. His right hand and his holy, holy arm had gotten him the victory. You sometimes you think, well, Jesus is going to be victorious. No, no, Jesus was victorious at the cross. He won the battle at the cross. And, and you say, well, why is this continuing then? That's what we're going to study about. Now notice what it continues saying. The battle had been won. His right hand and his holy arm had gotten him the victory. As a conqueror, he planted his banner on the eternal heights. Was there not joy among the angels? All heaven triumphed in the Savior's victory. Satan was defeated and knew that his kingdom was lost. Notice it doesn't say that his kingdom would be lost, it says his, he knew that his kingdom was lost. Satan lost the throne and he lost this world when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. You say, well it doesn't look like it. But looks can be deceiving, and that's what we're going to study about. Now John, about 60 years after this, looking backwards, reminisced about how heaven reacted when Jesus died on the cross and won the victory. It's found in Revelation chapter 12 and verses 10 through 12. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Notice he doesn't say will be cast down, has been cast down. It's talking about what happened at the cross. And it continues saying, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. And now notice that heaven can rejoice, but the earth has to, be, has to really be worried. Because uh, it continues saying here, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. <laughs> the pest is, is gone now. 
See, before the cross, the devil went representing this world in the heavenly councils, but he was cast out because he's no longer the ruler of this world. Now Jesus represents this world. And so uh, it, it says here, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. The pest is gone from heaven. Ah, but notice the earth. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. That's us. For the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has what? That he has a short time. So Jesus won the victory at the cross of Calvary. Now, in one of our previous studies, we noticed that there's a very intimate link between the victory of Jesus at the cross and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. I hope that you remember that. Uh, the Lord is our rock. Remember we studied the rock episodes and we noticed how uh, uh, there was a very intimate connection between the sacrifice and the fire, between striking the rock and water coming forth from the rock. In other words, there's an intimate connection between the victory of Jesus on the cross and what happened on the day of Pentecost. Now what is the connection between these two events? We have to go and analyze what happened on the day of Pentecost. So go with me to Acts chapter 2 and we're going to read verses 1 through 4 and I'm going to emphasize uh, four main points in this passage. Acts chapter 2 and verses 1 through 4. Now when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all, they, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a, what? Rushing mighty wind. First idea that I want you to remember. A rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided, what? Tongues as of fire. So you have wind and you have fire. And one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with what? with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak, here's the third concept, with what? With other tongues. Were these languages? Yes. Yeah, this was not gibberish. This was the ability to speak the languages of those who were present there for the Feast of Pentecost. And so it says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues. And who gave them the ability to speak with other tongues? As the Spirit gave them utterance. So who gave them the gift of the Holy Spirit? or the gift of tongues, it was the Holy Spirit that gave the gift. So you have a mighty rushing wind, you have tongues as a fire, then you have languages imparted, and the Holy Spirit is the one who gave the ability to speak the languages. Now I want us to go to a very interesting passage that we find in the Old Testament. Do you know what was the first time in the Bible where the gift of tongues was given? At the Tower of Babel. So we have to go back there and see how it happened back then. Go with me to Genesis chapter 11 verses 8 and 9. Genesis 11 and verses 8 and 9. After God confused the languages there, it says here, So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because now listen carefully, because there the Lord confused the language of all of the earth. Who confused the language? Who gave the gift of tongues at Babel? The Lord. It says the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. The Lord gave them the ability to speak different languages, and the Lord scattered them all over the earth. But now I want to read you a very interesting statement that we find in the book Story of Redemption, page 73. The Lord did it, but how did the Lord accomplish this work of giving these builders of the Tower of Babel the ability to speak the many languages that exist in the world today? Because before this, they all spoke the same language. They were all on the same page. So, so something happened to, to give them the ability to speak all of the languages of the earth. Now notice what we find here in Story of Redemption, page 73. They had built their tower to a lofty height. Now listen. When the Lord sent two angels to confound them in their work. What did the Lord do? He sent what? Angels. Two angels to confound them in their work. Men had been appointed for the purpose of receiving word from the workmen at the top of the tower, calling for material for their work, 
which the first uh, would communicate to the second and he to the third until the word reached those on the ground. As the word was passing from one to another in its descent, the angels confounded their language, and when the word reached the workmen upon the ground, material was called for which had not been required. Lightning from heaven, do you know angels are compared with lightning by the way? Lightning from heaven as a token of God's wrath broke off the top of their tower casting it to the ground. So who was it that uh, gave this gift of speaking in many different languages? It was God through the ministry of angels. The angels plugged in a Rosetta stone <laughs> in the minds of the Babel builders. You know, Rosetta Stone is a famous uh, language course that they sell today. There was no Rosetta Stone back then, I realize. But, but the angels, by a, by a miraculous intervention, they, they programmed the minds of those individuals to speak perfectly the languages that exist in the world today. Now you say, what possible relationship can this have with the day of Pentecost? Well, if you have tongues at Babel imparted by God through the ministry of the angels, the question is, is it just possible that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was God giving the gift of tongues through the ministry of the angels? Let's pursue this. Let's go to Psalm 104, Psalm 104, and we're going to read verses uh, actually 3 and 4. Psalm 104 and verses 3 and 4. I want you to notice I'm going to read first of all from the New King James Version and then I'm going to read from the New International Version which translates it a little bit differently and I think more correctly. It says in the New King James Version, speaking about God, He lays the beams of His upper chambers in the waters, who makes the clouds His chariot. What do clouds represent in the Bible? Angels, right? Jesus is coming with the clouds, it means that He's going to come with the angels. So it says here, who makes the clouds His chariot, who walks on the wings of the wind, who makes His angels spirits, His ministers a flame of fire. Are you following me? So He makes His angels what? Spirits and His ministers a flame of fire. Now you say, what relationship does that have to do with Pentecost? Well, we need to read from the New International Version, and I'm going to tell you why I believe this is a better translation. It says in the NIV, He lays the beams of His upper chambers on, the wa on their waters. He makes the clouds His chariot, and rides on the wings of the wind. He makes winds His messengers, and flames of fire His servants. Do you see the difference? He makes winds his messengers, and he makes flames of fire his servants. You say, well, why does the King James translate that he makes his angels spirits, whereas the NIV translates that he makes winds his messengers? Let me explain the reason why. In the Hebrew, the word ruach is translated both spirit and wind. In other words, uh, it, the context determines whether it's talking about the Spirit or whether it's talking about the wind. In the New Testament, the Greek word pneuma is also translated Spirit and wind, depending on the context. For example, you remember Jesus spoke about the work of the Holy Spirit to Nicodemus and He said, you know, the wind, you can see the effects of the wind, but you can't see the wind. That's the, word, that's the same word, pneuma, Spirit. So it's perfectly proper to translate uh, that he makes his messengers winds, and he makes his servants what? Flames of fire. Let me ask you, what were the two phenomena that took place on the day of Pentecost? Wind and what else? Wind and fire. Interesting. Now, you say, well, uh, who are these messengers that we have here? It says, you know, it says, he makes winds his messengers, flames of fire his servants. Okay, his messengers and his servants, who are they? Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 7, and I'm reading once again from the NIV, which I believe is a better translation. I'm not saying that uh, the NIV is the best translation uh, in everything, because uh, the NIV leaves a lot of texts out, it mistranslates many texts, and, and so I'm not saying that it's best always. 
but I'm saying that sometimes the translation is better, not the manuscript trail, but the translation. Now notice Hebrews 1 verse 7, in speaking of the angels he says, he makes his angels winds, his servants what? Flames of fire. So the angels are the winds and the angels are the flames of fire. And you're saying, are you saying, Pastor Boy, that on the day of Pentecost, God unleashed his angels to give the apostles the gift of speaking tongues? Is that the way that God worked on the day of Pentecost? I believe that that's the way that God did it, and the spirit of prophecy confirms it. Let me read you four statements from the spirit of prophecy on this specific point. The first of these is found in the devotional book, My Life Today, page 58. Listen carefully to what Ellen White had to say. When the truth in its simplicity is lived in every place, then God will work through His angels as He worked on the day of Pentecost, and hearts will be changed so decidedly that there will be a manifestation of the influence of genuine truth as is represented in the descent of the Holy Spirit. Did you catch what she's saying? When the truth in its simplicity is lived in every place, then God will work through His angels as He worked on the day of Pentecost. Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 57. She says, When the angels of heaven come among us and work through human agents, there will be solid, substantial conversions after the order of the conversions after the day of Pentecost. Once again, the angels linked and connected with what happened at Pentecost. Manuscript Releases, volume 10, page 112, is this remarkable statement. All heaven is interested in your salvation, and angels of God are waiting to do for you what they did for the early disciples on the day of Pentecost. Angels are waiting to do for you what they did for the apostles on the day of Pentecost. And one final one, that I may know him, page 57, through the ministry of the angels, listen carefully now, through the ministry of the angels, the Holy Spirit is enabled to work upon the mind and heart of the human agent and draw him to Christ. How does the Holy Spirit draw people to Christ? Through what? Through the ministry of the angels, it says here. Through the ministry of the angels, the Holy Spirit is enabled to work upon the mind and heart of the human agent and draw him to Christ, who has paid the ransom money for his soul, that the sinner may be rescued from the slavery of sin and Satan. Interesting. Now, God works according to a chain of command. God has a chain of command. God does not do everything directly Himself. Now the Bible attributes everything to God, because God ultimately is the source of everything, but God delegates responsibility. Now the key text is found in Revelation chapter 1 and verses 1 through 5. Revelation chapter 1 and verses 1 through 5. Here is God's chain of command. It says there, the revelation of Jesus Christ which what? God gave him to show his servants. So, so who gives the message to Jesus? God does. Now who does Jesus give it to? Actually Jesus gives it to the Holy Spirit because with every church it says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So God the Father gives the message to Jesus, and then Jesus gives it to whom? Jesus gives it to the Holy Spirit, and then I want you to notice, let's continue reading, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And then uh, I have, I've inserted chapter 2 and verse 7, He who has an ear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then it continues saying, And he sent and signified it by his what? By his angel, to whom? To his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all the things which he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Do you see the chain of command? Who does God give the message to? Jesus. Who does Jesus give the message to? The Holy Spirit. Who does the Holy Spirit give the message to? The angel. Who does the angel give the message to? John. And who does John send the message to? 
the seven churches. And what are the seven churches supposed to do? Sit on it. No, they're supposed to what? They're supposed to take the message and they're supposed to proclaim it to the world. So God has a chain of command. In other words, God doesn't come down and do everything himself. God delegates responsibility. He's the great delegator. God is not a dictator. God could do everything himself if he wanted to. But God has chosen to operate in this specific way. Now let me give you an illustration of how it works. This is a very interesting illustration that we're going to take a look at now. You remember the story of the centurion that came to Jesus wanting Jesus to heal his servant? Now let's read that passage in the light of what we're studying. It's found in Matthew chapter 8 and verses 5 through 10. Matthew chapter 8 and verses 5 through 10. This centurion was not a Jew, but he understood how God operates better than the Jews did. Notice what, what uh, this story says. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Notice, I'll, I'll come and, and I'll heal him. I'll come to your house. And now notice what this centurion says. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. But only speak a word and my servant will be healed. And you know what I used to think? I used to think that when Jesus said, okay, be healed, somehow mystically the word would fly through the air and the person would be healed. I don't believe that. Because Jesus had a way in which he healed. In a moment I'm going to read you a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy explaining this episode. Notice, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority. In other words, I have authority having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. In other words, he says, I'm the commander, and I have soldiers that do what I tell them to do. Now let me read you Ellen White's interpretation of this. It's magnificent. It's found in Desire of Ages, page 316. She's quoting the centurion. It's as if the centurion is speaking. As I represent the power of Rome and my soldiers recognize my authority as supreme, so dost thou, speaking to Jesus, represent the power of the infinite God and all created things obey thy word. Thou canst command the disease to depart and it shall obey thee. Thou canst summon thy heavenly messengers and they shall impart healing virtue. Speak but the word and my servant shall be healed. Are you understanding how it works? Jesus said he's healed. At that time what happened? The angel was whizzing through the air and going to impart healing virtue to that servant. That's the way that God operates. You know and, and uh, you say, how, do you, how did you go down this road? I as, ad as an Adventist pastor, I believe that we need a 29th fundamental belief in our church. The 29th fundamental belief would be the ministry of angels. Because we have very little, if nothing, in our fundamental belief about angels. And the Bible is saturated with the ministry of angels. And we have not even half begun to understand the ministry of angels. How they are the connecting link between God and us. They are the connecting link between God and us. They are extremely important in the operation of the universe. And so Ellen White says, quoting Christ, uh, quoting the centurion, Thou canst summon the heavenly messengers, and they shall impart healing virtue. Speak but the word, and my servant shall be healed. Do you know who performed the miracles of Christ? Let's me read this statement from, from a Desire of Ages, page 143. This is a, in, a, an unbelievable statement. Well, I shouldn't say unbelievable because I believe it. But unbelievable in the sense that we're not accustomed to think this way. The angels of God are ever passing from heaven, from earth to heaven, and from heaven to earth. The, and by the way, in Spirit of Prophecy, volume 2, page 67 and 68, Ellen White adds all. 
all the miracles of Christ for the afflicted and suffering were wrought by the power of God through the ministration of the angels. And it is through Christ, by the ministration of His heavenly messengers, that every blessing comes from God to us. How do we receive every blessing from God? By the heavenly messengers. Now let me read you two statements about blessings, who blesses us. Notice in heavenly places, page 113, it says there is one blessing that all may have who seek for it in the right way. It is the Holy Spirit of God, and this is a blessing that brings all other blessings in its train. But we just read in the previous statement that uh, every blessing comes to us through the heavenly messengers. Are you with me or not? Notice the devotional book, Our High Calling, page 129. I have been shown angels of God, all ready to impart grace and power to those who feed, feel their need of divine strength. They, they impart grace and power, folks. Of course, it's not their own grace and power, it's the grace and power of the Holy Spirit. They are merely the conductors of the power of the Holy Spirit. She continues saying, but these heavenly messengers will not bestow blessings unless solicited. They have waited for the cry from souls, hungering and thirsting for the blessing of God. Now, what connection is there between the cross and Pentecost? Are we, are we doing well so far? Yeah. Between the cross and Pentecost. In the Old Testament, folks, the Holy Spirit is very seldom mentioned. He is mentioned, but very seldom. And the reason is very simple. Everything in the Old Testament was done by Jesus Christ. He was the angel of the Lord. He was Michael the archangel. He was in charge of the pilgrimage of, Egypt, uh, of the children of Israel from Egypt to Canaan. He was in the pillar of cloud. He was in the pillar of fire. He was the one that accomplished the work. And Ellen White says that every time that God tried to intervene in, on this earth, uh, in the Old Testament, Satan cried, Foul! You're, you're intruding on my territory. I'm the king here and this is my territory. What gives you the right to come in and to interfere in my territory? He always complained. Like when God came down to resurrect Moses. Jesus came to resurrect Moses. Oh, he railed against God saying, He's mine. He's in my realm. I'm the king here. How dare you come and take what is mine? But Satan was defeated at the cross. And Jesus legally recovered this world. He is now the king, and this is his territory. And we need to understand that because at the cross, Jesus won the throne, and he won the territory, and therefore this is his now. And so Jesus says, hey, if I want to unleash all of my angels upon my planet, I can do it, because this is legally mine. Because you beat Adam, but I beat you. And so as he became your servant, you're my servant now. Now. In other words, the cross was D-Day. It was the decisive battle in the great controversy. Ellen White expressed it in Desire of Ages 758 by saying that Satan knew that his kingdom was lost. He was defeated. But let me ask you, is Satan going to simply uh, lie down and, and, and say, okay, I give up? No, no. Satan is not going to give up this territory without a fight. He's not just going to give up and surrender. He's going to hang on to every inch that he can of the territory that is legally Christ's. And so Jesus now says, okay, this is my planet, and I am the king of this planet, so now I am going to unleash all of my troops to help my earthly troops go and conquer the territory which belongs to me, which you do not want to give up. Are you following me? Notice this statement from Desire of Ages, page 352. Uh, Ellen White is talking about the apostles. She says, they are to contend with supernatural forces, but they are assured of supernatural help. All, listen carefully, all the intelligences of heaven are in this army, and more than angels are in the ranks. The Holy Spirit, the representative of the captain of the Lord's host, comes down to direct the battle. And who are the soldiers? The soldiers are the heavenly angels, and who are the earthly soldiers? We are. You see, you know what our role is? 
It's simply to tell the world that they're with the loser. And if you stay with the loser, you're lost. So we have to tell them, you desert that army, you come over to the army of the winner. Amen. That's, that's what our evangelistic task is all about, is to call people to forsake the army of the loser and to come over to the army of the winner. Now did you notice here that Ellen White says the Holy Spirit, the representative of the captain of the Lord's host. How many people are involved in that statement? The Holy Spirit, the representative of the captain of the Lord's host. How many? Three. There's three there, three persons. One, the Holy Spirit. Number two, the captain, because the Holy Spirit is the representative of the captain. And the host is the Lord's. So since Jesus assumed humanity, the representative of the captain is now the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus is in heaven, encumbered by a human body. And so the Holy Spirit now performs through the angels the work that Jesus used to perform in the Old Testament through the hosts. And so what is our task? Our task, folks, is to go out and tell the world that Jesus has legally won the throne of this world. And that this world belongs to Him. And that they're supposed to come over to the side of the winner. And God has promised to unleash all of the angels of heaven. That's what He did on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit unleashed upon this earth all of the angelic hosts, the earth that Jesus had won, to help the apostles in the preaching of the gospel. It's interesting to notice that in Acts chapter 8, verse 26 and also verse 29, I want you to notice how the Spirit speaking and the angels speaking are used interchangeably. You remember Philip when he uh, went to speak with the Ethiopian eunuch? Now listen to what it says in Acts chapter 8 and verse 26. It says, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And then a little bit later in the story, it says, Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. So who's speaking? Is it the angel or is it the Holy Spirit? It's the Holy Spirit through what? The Holy Spirit through the angel. In other words, the Holy Spirit accomplishes His work through the ministry of the angels. The Holy Spirit is in the command and control center of the universe, if you please. And the Holy Spirit coordinates the angelic host. He says to this one, go there. He says to the other one, go there. This individual is struggling with sin, go help him. This individual is preaching the gospel, go and influence the people that are listening. In other words, the Holy Spirit through the angels accomplishes the work of impacting human hearts. Now let me ask you, why aren't we seeing the tremendous convicting power that was seen after the day of Pentecost? It's very simple. The Holy Spirit needs earthly soldiers who will cooperate with Him. You see, the disciples went through basic training. And they learned to take orders from their commander. And to render Him unquestioning obedience. In other words, they were prepared to receive the help of the Holy Spirit through the ministry of the angels because they had made a total commitment to their commander. The reason why today we don't see the same power is because we do not commit ourselves without reservation to the Lord the way that the apostles and those who preached the gospel at first did. And so the angels are waiting to work through us, but they can't work through us because we are always interested in fulfilling our own agendas. I want to read from this um, book, devotional book, A Call to Stand Apart, page 66. This is a well-known statement speaking about the youth in the church. Uh, and uh, it has something very important to say about the ministry of angels through, through uh, the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what, what Ellen White had to say about our youth. There is no line of work in which it is possible for the youth to receive greater benefit. All who engage in ministry are God's helping hand. They are co-workers with the angels. What are we? We're God's helping hand. Uh, and how does God help us? Through the ministry of the angels. Then she says, rather, now she's going to explain, rather they are the human agencies through whom the angels accomplish their mission. Angels speak through their voices and work by their hands 
and the human workers cooperating with heavenly agencies have the benefit of their, that is the angels, education and experience. As a means of education, what university course can equal this? With such an army of workers as our youth, rightly trained, see there's a boot camp, right? And, and learning to accept the commands of your commander. Uh, so, so she says, um, once again, um, with such an army of workers as our youth, rightly trained, might furnish, how soon the message of a crucified, risen, and soon coming Savior might be carried to the whole world. How soon might the end come, the end of suffering and sorrow and sin. How soon, in place of a possession here, with its blight of sin and pain, our children might receive their inheritance, where the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever, where the inhabitant shall not say, I am sick, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard. How soon it would happen if an army of youth, rightly trained, and lending themselves to the power of God through the ministry of the angels, were willing to accomplish the work of God. Now do we believe that there's going to be a final outpouring of the Holy Spirit on this world? Amen. A final outpouring of the Holy Spirit in latter rain power? We most certainly do. And you say, well what must the outpouring of the latter rain be? Well if the outpouring of the early rain by the Holy Spirit means that the Holy Spirit through the angels helped the disciples in accomplishing their work, is it just possible that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the end is going to have something to do with God unleashing all of the angelic hosts upon the earth again because we have lent ourselves as God's earthly army to be used by the heavenly agencies? Absolutely. Let me read you some statements from the Spirit of Prophecy. The book Maranatha, page 212, Ellen White explains, listen carefully, before the work of God is closed up, and the sealing of God's people is finished, we shall receive the outpouring of the Spirit of God, angels from heaven will be in our midst. So what is the outpouring of the Spirit of God? Angels will be in our midst. Doesn't mean that the angels have the power in themselves, they are the emissaries of the Holy Spirit, they are the foot soldiers of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in the command and control center, and everything is under His control. We're not giving glory to the angels. The angels lend themselves as instruments in the hands of the Holy Spirit, and we are to lend ourselves as instruments in the hands of the angels. Amen. But the chain of command is broken when it gets to us. You know, sometimes I think of Isaiah, you know, the vision that Isaiah had. You know, after he saw the holiness of God, he says, I'm undone, for I'm a sinful man, and I live in the midst of a people that, that are sinful. My eyes have seen the glory of the Lord, the holiness of the Lord. And then he hears a conversation in heaven where a question is asked, who will go and tell Israel about this vision that Isaiah has seen? And what did Isaiah say? Isaiah said, here am I, send him. <laughs> That's not what Isaiah said. He says, well, who better than me? Here am I, send me. And he was sent, and he was helped. And as a result, he was put in the hollow log, and it was sawn in half. And he died as a martyr, and someday we are going to see him again. Praise the Lord. Now, in Review and Herald, January 20, 1891, we have another statement about how the work is going to be accomplished under the power of the latter rain. It says here, after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, thousands were converted. Now how did this happen? Let's continue reading. Thousands, uh, it says, uh, after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, thousands were converted. Notice this. Angels of God that excel in strength, clothed with the brightness of heaven, came to what? To the help of the church and swept back the forces of Satan. The work of the Holy Spirit was not limited to apostolic days. It is not confined to any church, large or small. The field of his ministration is the world. He will convince the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now listen carefully. But the instrumentalities through which the Holy Spirit works are the members of Christ's body, those who believe in his name. It is through these light bearers that the gospel is to be carried to all the nations of the earth. Now I'd like to mention one final thing before we close. Do you remember... Uh, the individual who had a son that was on his dying bed in Capernaum. He was in Cana of Galilee, this is in John chapter 4, and he had a son that was in Capernaum and he was dying. 
So he says to Jesus, would you please heal my son? And Jesus says, uh, says, oh, this generation, unless they see signs, they won't believe. But Jesus pronounced the words. He says, don't worry, he's well. And this man believed Jesus. And, and we know that he believed Jesus because, uh, because he didn't go right home. He could have gone home that same day and arrived before dark. But he decided to hang around. And the next day, you know, he, he began his uh, trip, and Ellen White says he enjoyed the songs of the birds and the sunshine. He was having a great time because he knew that his son had been healed. Amen. And so when he got back home, uh, he asked, at what time was my son healed? They said, at such and such a time. And he said, that's exactly the time Jesus said the word. Now I want to read you two statements from the Spirit of Prophecy and how this happened. Very interesting. The first is in Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2, page 155. Instead of going to Capernaum, speaking of Jesus, Jesus, by a flash of divine telegraphy, sends the message of healing to the bedside of the suffering son. <laughs> I like that expression, by a flash of di divine telegraphy. In other words, Jesus sent the message by telegraph to the angel who was over there waiting. And then another statement is found in the Youth Instructor, December 4, 1902, and the power of the words of the Redeemer flashes like lightning from Cana to Capernaum, and the child is healed. The nobleman knows his faith uh, by, shows his faith by not insisting on the presence of Jesus, and immediately the power of Satan is rebuked. The dying boy feels the joy of restoration. Amen. Angels in the Bible are compared to lightning. And so, folks, the Holy Spirit is waiting for us. The Holy Spirit is, wa is waiting to unleash all the angelic hosts upon this world to finish God's work. And the big question is, will we lend ourselves as willing instruments in God's hand? The decision is ours. <laughs>